Hi, I'm Andy, and this is a video about um, saving state in uh, the Android game that I'm writing called Rabbit Escape. Um, you can see the game working uh, on the screen here. This is in an emulator. <coughs> um, I don't know whether the pause button was working last time I showed you. This is the first time I've shown you it running in an emulator. I figured that stuff out. Um, you basically just have to download um, an, uh, an emulator, a, a sort of hardware package in the um, virtual machine manager in Android um, and then choose it as the thing that you run with when you run uh, so not as difficult as I uh, first thought so this video is about how to save um, how I managed to save and restore the state um, and the funny thing about Android uh, applications is that they do this saving and restoring state thing every single time you rotate the app from horizontal to vertical or vertical to horizontal, you can disable that. Um, you can either make make it so that um, it, it it never changes when you um, you can just set your app to be always horizontal, always landscape, or always portrait, um, which avoids that. Or you can say that I want to manually handle that change instead of rebuilding the application from scratch. But the fact is, uh, when the user goes away to a different place or something else, you are going to need to save. Um, the state of your program at that point because when the user gets dropped back in again because uh, they want to go back to your app they want to see it exactly how it was before but Android might have thrown it away in the meantime uh, and I think the reason why they've um, they've made it al uh, always save and restore the state even when you just rotate the screen is kind of to make that problem front and centre for you so you don't put it off uh, until later you make sure you handle it so um, what happens is when the when your game or application might get thrown away it doesn't definitely but when it might get thrown away um, Android asks you to um, <coughs> well it, it notifies you that it's going to get thrown away and it asks you to save um, your state and then it provides you later on a method saying uh, rest restore yourself from what you saved so what you save it into um, is basically a Java object called a bundle and that's and that's exactly the object that you get passed later on you have to get it back. So what I'm saving, when I save the state of the game, what I'm saving is exactly where all the rabbits are uh, and what they're doing at the time, whether they're bashing or something like that. But also where any tokens are. So if I've dropped a basher token down here, uh, I need to save where that is. So basically everything that's going on in the game needs to get saved. Um, and uh, and also things like the states of the buttons, so which of these buttons is pressed and uh, how many bashes you've got left and all, all that stuff. Um, so I had a, um, a chunk of that work already done because the game state in, in Rabbit Escape is already um, savable as um, uh, basically a sort of ASCII art version of uh, a level, and that saves the positions of rabbits and things like that. The part that I didn't handle, which I'll show you how I handled, is um, when more than one rabbit is in a particular location when there's more than one thing uh, in one square and the format that I had before it just didn't handle that because I didn't need to for things like unit tests um, and for the for the text UI it actually just displays one of the many things that might be in that square and that's okay for that um, but for this you need to save the exact thing so we need to do that um, and the other thing that I needed to handle was I needed to make this whole saving of state work with the, with an, the independent thread there's a thread running um, which which animates the actual game or you know, runs the actual game. I needed to make sure that my state saving uh, works in that kind of multi-threaded world. So where should we start? Well, let's start with um, the Android code that you need um, to do. So when you're in an activity, you can override this um, this method called on save instant state, um, and that and that will basically that's enough. It, um, there's a lot of stuff you can read on the Android site about when your state, when you might need to save state and when you might need to restore it. Um, but the short answer is, um, if if you always save yourself when on save instant state gets called, and then if you always restore yourself when on create gets called, you'll notice that your saved state gets passed into on create. Uh, then you're safe. You're basically okay. Um, so that's what I've done. So on save instant state gets called just before the pause event or just after the pause event. I'm not sure, but you don't have to care about that. All you care about is 
if you're given a bundle, you've got to stick stuff in it. So the bundle can only save uh, basic stuff like strings, integers, and things like that. So if you want to put more complicated stuff than that in, you've got to make up a, some kind of file format yourself, um, which is what I've done. So first thing I do when we come into here, you always have to call the super method. Um, and what I do is I put an integer into that state, um, which is basically which ability you have clicked on, uh, a basher or a digger or something like that. So that's very simple, just save a number that tells it which um, which index has been checked. And then the hard bit is saving the whole state of the game. So what I've done is I've got this surface thing, and inside there is my game loop and everything. So I made a method called onSaveInstantState on my surface. And if I go in there and have a look at that, it's here. So this is in my game surface view. Um, and all that does is pass on. If I've got a game, I know I've got a game loop. So I go on into another method that I've also called on save instant state inside the game loop. Um, <coughs> notice that those methods don't override anything. They're just, I just name them the same because they do the same job. Um, and then, uh, this, this bit does some fairly simple stuff. So it puts in a boolean saying, uh, is it paused? Yes or no. Uh, and it puts in where you where you've scrolled to on the screen, uh, so that's fairly simple. And it also puts in a string, which is the entire state of the game world. Um, and what I've done is I've got a I've got a method which turns the whole world into an array of strings, and then I've written a little method which um, turns an array uh, of strings into a single string joined together by uh, new line characters. That's just convenience to turn this into a string. And then the real magic happens inside this world saving object. So the naive way to do this, <coughs> and the way I did it first, is I would just in here, uh, I would just turn my world um, into a string and then write it in. But it occurred to me that um, that wasn't very good because there's actually there are actually two threads running at the same time here. Um, this thread, this on save instant state thread. Um, is in the kind of Android main uh, UI thread. And by the way, whatever you do in here shouldn't take too long because everything will freeze while it's happening. So, uh, And the user won't see any response to what they told it to do, for example, rotating the screen. So um, you can't take too long here. Anyway, all this stuff's running in that thread, whereas uh, I've got another thread running, which is my actual game loop. Um, if you're not writing a game, you probably won't have this problem. But if you're writing a game... Um, with a, a separate game loop thread, you do have, you do have to worry about this thing. So um, what I needed to do was make sure that the um, uh, what I didn't want to happen was that the game loop thread would be changing stuff while I was saving it, so I'd end up with an inconsistent save state. Um, so what I need to do, the easiest thing to do then, is to get the game loop to actually stop and save the world itself, and then give it back to the other thread. So that's what I've done. So if I go into this um, wait until save method. Where I am is in this class called World Saver, which is basically entirely used for this purpose. And um, uh, so it's got this wait until saved method. So what that basically does is, first of all, if the game loop's not running, then it just it just saves the world and returns. But normally, what will happen is the game loop is running, and in that case, what we do is we we basically ask the game loop to save the world for us. So this request, so save world equals true means please save the world. And then we also have to then send a sort of signal to the other thread. So I'll show you this request save object in a minute, but basically that's just kind of a, um, a signal that the game loop can listen to. Uh, so I'm just saying speak, which means basically just say, say that I want you to do something. And because I've set this boolean save world, that thread will wake up and see that that's set and do its job. Um, and then uh, and then what I have to do then is listen for a signal coming back from the game loop. So um, I expect the game loop to set this saved world um, object to be non-null. So while it's still null, um, I just sit and wait. Um, and what I do is I wait forever. So this um, this uh, listen method on this, um, uh, this, this is another signal. So there's two signals involved here. There's this thing called request save and this thing called save. So Request save is a signal that we're sending to the other thread, and saved is something we can listen to for that thread signaling back to us. And I'm saying listen zero, which means wait for as long as it takes. Just just wait there until the other thread says it's finished. When the other thread is finished, we trust it that it's put something into saved world, so we return that something, and then we just set saved world back to null in case this all happens again, and then return the answer. 
So we need to explain what this request save and these saved things are, because I've kind of made them up. Um, hopefully, if I've missed something that, that Java gives you natively, <coughs> excuse me, uh, someone will leave a comment uh, telling me how to do this better. What I've done is I've made a little class called Signal, um, and basically, it um, it kind of wraps up all the synchronization that you need to do around this stuff, um, and uh, catching an interrupted exception and so on. So basically, the speak method. Um, uh, basically notifies <coughs> so basically what that means is tell tell anyone who's listening something in, so in this case the two types of speak there are is the speak that we've already seen which says basically I'm requesting a save and there's a, there'll be another speak which which um, causes this listen function to finish listening so when, when we speak basically we call this notify thing so this is a built-in Java um, Function that, that's available on the um, object 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 class, um, uh, and the subtlety here is that it, that that notify always has to be within a synchronized block. So basically, um, notify tells anyone who is who is uh, locked waiting for this synchronized thing, anyone who's synchronized on this object, this signal object, not just that class, but the, this instance of this class. Uh, that something's happened. It wakes them up. If they were, um, if they were waiting on that, um, on this instance of its object, uh, then it tells them something's happened. So basically, by putting a synchronized um, uh, declaration on this method, we're saying uh, only one person can execute uh, anything that's synchronized on this object at the same time. So um, if someone's if someone's uh, waiting on listen. Uh, uh, on that instance of that signal, if they're if they're calling this wait method, which is in listen, um, then they they will get woken up when someone else calls this speak method. Okay, I hope I'm getting somewhere with this. So basically, this is a slight wrapping up of something that's already built into Java, which is this notify thing and this wait thing. <coughs> uh, notify means anyone who's waiting on you should possibly get woken up. Um, and wait means wait for anyone to notify. Um, uh, and if wait time is not zero, then wait, you wait only a specific amount of time. The wait that we've seen so far was was a call to listen where we passed in zero, so it would just wait forever. So basically, there are these two signals that get created when this world server got created. So this world server got created as part of the game loop. Let's find that. Um, so. Yeah, if this seems complicated, it's because um, multi-threading is difficult and possibly because I'm not explaining it very well. Um, so when you make your when you make your Android game loop, you make this world saver object. So there's there's one world saver object, and when that world saver object gets made, it makes two signal objects. And these signal objects are the things that you can call listen and speak on. Um, the, the, so there's one for saying I want a save to happen and there's one for saying a save has happened um, so the one we've seen most of so far is that we, we request a save to happen basically we call speak so that means there's got to be someone listening on this uh, on this request save thing so let's try and find where that is so um, where that happens is in the game loop. So basically, the main game loop now, whenever it waits, instead of just doing a thread dot sleep like it used to, let's find where it is. So wait for next frame is one of the places where, where we wait. It used to say thread dot sleep here. Now what it says is wait unless there's a save signal. So basically, let's go into there. What that says is is for the amount of time we've told you to wait wait for this request save signal, listen in for this request save signal. So normally what will happen is that will wait the amount of time we say, which is something like uh, you know, 100 milliseconds or something like that. But if we got a signal earlier than that, we'll stop immediately and we'll jump straight out. And all we'll do is stop uh, stop waiting. We won't do anything clever yet. But what we then do is, oops, what we then do is once we've done a wait and less save signal, we then immediately call check. So every time we call that, we later, we later on call that. And what check does here is it says if we've been told to save the world, then save the world and then tell someone who's listening that we've saved the world. So that's uh, that's where the speak bit of the um, save signal happens. So 
Um, you'll notice that we call this actually save world thing. But um, so you you might wonder, well, why is that any better than just calling it um, right the way out where we started? Well, the reason why it's better is because where this check gets called from is inside this wait for next frame, which is inside the actual the real game loop. So when we call check, we come in here and we actually save the world. This is running in the same thread that normally does the game loop. So what that means is that the game isn't happening while this stuff's happening. Nothing's changing in the game that could mess up our saving. Um, so we basically succeeded here in uh, preventing more than one thread working on the same bit of state that we we want to be working on by actually doing the saving in the middle of the game loop. When we finish saving, we call speak on the saved signal. And we happen to know that someone else is listening in on the saved signal because this while loop here is saying listen on the saved signal. So as soon as this, um, as soon as that speak gets called, which means the save has actually, has finished, it's actually save world has been done inside the game loop, it's going to call speak. And that means that this guy here who's listening can now carry on, get, grab the saved world, um, and return, return that. Uh, uh, and that's basically how it works. So uh, there's a lot of hoop jumping here, a lot of stuff going on, but I, I feel like it's important to split out uh, any stuff that's synchronized out into its own little bit and not mix it up with the rest of the code, otherwise I get really confused. So I got this working in about an hour, and then I spent about two or three hours fighting it, wrangling with it, until I got it to a point where I felt I could understand it. And I ended up with this signal class. With this just just small wrapper around notify and wait. But you should bear in mind that the wrapper is not just uh, this little bit of code and the total lack of code here. The key thing is, the a part of this wrapper is the synchronized here and the synchronized here. Um, so wait and notify must be inside a, a synchronized block. Uh, I didn't want to do that explicitly. I wanted it, this idea of a, as a signal that you kind of register for and then, and then hear about. Um, and that seemed to work. So, anything else to show you there? So that's the main thing. If you're doing, if you're writing an Android app that doesn't have a, a separate thread to do the game loop like that, um, you probably don't need to worry about this. This is um, specific to that case. But it's something that I had to handle. Um, and then once you've got the state saved, obviously in your onCreate method, you need to uh, unsave it again, restore stuff back. So I have to do things like find out whether the pause button was pressed and things like that. Um, and then the and then the big thing that I have to do is actually make the world. So um, I make the world out of that um, that string uh, which I saved in, and I've already got this text world manip thing, uh, which you'll have seen if you watched earlier videos, which basically takes a, a text representation of the world uh, and turns that into a real world, and also does the opposite. So I guess now's a good time to demonstrate to you that this really works. So I can't get the emulator to switch over from being landscape or portrait mode. I'm sure someone could tell me how, but let's do it on the real phone. So here you can see a little rabbit. Oh, let me get that one. You can just about see there a little rabbit walking back and forth. And then when I turn him the right way up, you can see the screen just flipped there. And now we're in portrait mode. If I get it right, you can see him walking around. I think I've pressed the pause button there. Or maybe he was paused all along. So you can see he's walking around, and if I flip it back again, he's still walking, and he's he, he reappeared in the same place in the map that it was in before. The paused or not paused state got preserved, which ability you clicked on got preserved, and so on. So it really is working. It took it took a lot of wrangling, and I guess what particularly took wrangling was the thread stuff. I, I find threads terribly confusing. Um, so I've shown you the um, uh, the multi-threading stuff, which to me I think is probably uh, the hardest bit of what, what I've done. The other bit I wanted to show you, hopefully this will be a shorter video than the other ones have been, is I wanted to show you um, the changes I made to actually saving the thread state. I also had to do one other little bit, which was that um, I had to make the... Um, Change uh, changes to the world part a little bit more robust. So the thing is, when you press buttons all over the UI um, that to add to drop tokens into the world or anything else that you, you might do in later versions, I have this concept of um, the ability to change the world. Um, 
Uh, but what I didn't have was was a sort of undo for that. I didn't need it before. But what I decided to do when I'm going to save the world um, is rather than applying any changes that are kind of pending, I would just undo them. Um, uh, the reason for that is uh, you're half you're kind of halfway through a time step at the point when you get asked to pause. So I didn't want to apply what changes had already been given to me at the wrong time, and then I'd have to restore again, and it would have been restored at the time step before when it should. So I figured the best thing to do was just um, undo whatever's happened. Hopefully not much has happened in that one time step. Um, and you're rotating the screen, so you probably didn't mean to do it anyway, or, or coming in from some other application. So it seems unlikely that uh, you would mind too much if that one thing that you've done, hopefully only one thing that you've done, gets reverted. It makes life a lot simpler for me, because otherwise I'd have to kind of remember it and apply it in the next time step, which is just complicated. So I made them undoable. So basically, this is a test for me adding some changes in and then reverting them and checking that uh, the world ends up how it should be, how it was before, even though I made all these changes. Some of these changes happen immediately. So the number of tokens you've got in the world immediately changes when we say add token, but the actual token doesn't appear until the next time step. So I needed to either yeah, I needed to basically, the best thing to do was undo what you've done. So again, this is all quite theoretical because it, um, you might think it doesn't matter too much um, if I forget this one little bit of state, but it would, there would be some subtle bugs where you had one less basher because you rotated the screen immediately after you bashed, unless I did this stuff properly. So I made this revert method on there. I made all this stuff synchronized so that you can't simultaneously uh, revert it and also be adding a block. That would be really bad, so. We revert the changes just before we save the state. Um, that seems to work. The other things I needed to do is I needed to make sure that my multi-threading code on this um, on this change, this state change thing, uh, was was genuinely um, synchronizing so that things couldn't, couldn't clash with each other. So what I what I did, I always said you don't need to make, use threads and tests, um, but my choice was between adding some kind of artificial um, pauses and oh, still in two threads. Basically, what I, what I wanted to check here is that my multi-threading code could handle lots of things happening at the same time. And so I had to write a little test that, that actually does a lot of things at the same time. I couldn't think of a good way to test it. So I'm kind of eating my words a bit about how to thread, how to test multi-threaded code. So please get in touch if you know a better way. Anyway, what I've done is made two threads which, which are based on this add tokens object. What add tokens does is runs does a hundred things, uh, which just add a, a token in a particular position in the world. And then I launch another thread uh, with a step a lot object. And what step a lot does is steps the world. So as you can see, a lot of adding token, a lot of also stepping the world happen at the same time. Uh, both those things use this changes object. And so I have to make sure that the changes object is properly synchronized, otherwise you'll get um, errors. So um, I, I, I wrote this test when I changed the implementation from using synchronized containers to the actual changes object itself being synchronized on the outside, which I needed in order to make revert work properly. Um, because you not you no longer just got clashes between people using individual containers, but actually revert shouldn't clash with any of the operations. So I needed synchronization at, at a high, higher level. Run all those threads, wait until T1 and T2 have stopped and then step a lot doesn't ever stop until you tell it to. So once what threads one and two have finished, uh, tell thread three to stop and then wait for it really to stop. <laughs> make another step to make sure everything's been applied and then check that all the, all the things in, in the, in thread one and thread two have actually happened. Um, so that's that test. Uh, this is the chat reverting changes test. And the other bit I wanted to show you was that previously my, uh, my world uh, the ability to save a world um, didn't include overlapping things, as I said earlier. So this is a little test for um, the situation where things are overlapping. So basically, when two when there's two things in a square, what I've decided to do is instead of putting an R there or a J to mean there's a rabbit facing right or facing left, um, what what I've done is is if, whenever there's more than one thing, I put a star there. And then I've allowed you later on to say what the star was, and it just takes these stars in order. So that, that first star up here is actually an R and a J on top of each other, and the next star here is a B and an I on top of each other, and the next star here is a backslash, which you have to write horribly in Java, followed by a D, 
on top of each other, and then the last star is a forward slash and a D. And all this test does is checks that that gets round tripped uh, through the uh, through the, the saving and, and loading mechanism. I've got a few other tests here, like um, you've got uh, when you've got overlapping stuff and you've got mess data, that all gets saved nicely. Uh, what else? Yeah, so basically when you when you save a world now, most of these squares are still, you know, an R or a J or something like that. But whenever there's, whenever there's something written on top of something else, um, uh, you get a start and then the start tells you what's there. And then the other part that I had to do was I had to make... Um, these are, the rabbits themselves have actually got some other state inside them. So previously the R and the J and, and stuff just to, told you whether or not the rabbit was facing right or facing left, but that's not all the state there is about a rabbit. There's also uh, how much, um, whether he's in the middle of bashing, whether he's in the middle of digging, uh, and for example for an entrance object um, you have to remember how long until the next rabbit's going to come out, things like that. So this is the little file format I made for that. So instead of just a lot, an R, you can have a curly brackets up there with some uh, properties inside. Um, so basically, basically what I'm saying is it turned out that um, the state that I was saving wasn't a complete representation of the world under all circumstances. So if you're writing an Android application, you have to write, you have to be able to turn the complete state of your application uh, into something that can be stored inside that bundle object, which is basically strings, integers, and stuff like that. And the, the way that I've chosen to do that um, is to make the whole thing into a great big string, or almost, almost the whole thing into a great big string, all the world state stuff. Uh, fortunately, I had most of that already because of my text interface. Uh, this gave me that last little bit. Uh, uh, and that's really it. So here's the game running uh, on an Android emulator. You can see the little rabbit's going to go into the thing and it'll tell me that I've won. Um, a few rough edges to polish off here. Um, actually, it's not telling me that I've won, but uh, it has stopped doing anything, which is its equivalent for now. So obviously, rough edges like noticing properly that you've won and telling you that you've won. Uh, and then unlocking the next level when you do win. Uh, a few little rough edges like that. Also, there's a few rough edges in the gameplay where, if, for example, if you start trying to bash when you're standing on a slope, um, it, it bashes in the wrong place. And you know, There's a few wrinkles like that. Um, I think probably I need to add another couple of abilities. I need to design a load of levels, and then I think I'll be ready for um, ready to release the first version. If you guys are gentle with me when that comes out, um, uh, I'll release versions with more exciting graphics and stuff like that. Um, anyway, so that's it um, for now. You can, uh, you've got to be able to save the whole state of your whole application uh, when you write an Android game, and you've got to make sure that if you're running multiple threads, uh, you deal with that nicely so that um, the, the thing you're saving doesn't change under you while you're saving it. Uh, that's it for now. See you next time.